Well, this week I'm going to be doing something a little different here at Dividend Cafe, and some of you may really like it because you're not going to hear from me a bunch. We're going to go right now to my interview with Louis Gov, who is the chief economist at GovCal Research, been based out of Hong Kong for the better part of 20 years. He's a French-born economist with deep um, uh, and multi-generational, by the way, his father, Charles, is an utterly brilliant economist. Uh, but deep economic study in the European region and Asian region, and has himself, I think, become one of the foremost experts on economic growth cycles and what's taking place right now, not just in China, but in the greater Asian territory. And I've learned a great deal from him about uh, particularly this subject I've been writing about lately regarding China's sovereign debt market and their currency contra policies and, and uh, trends in the United States. And I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. So uh, let's, let me get right into my in, interview with Louis Gov and, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. So let's, let's use this as a sort of break point in, in our chat to transition from the equity side to the debt and, and by implication, the currency side. Yeah. Um, your, your father wrote an absolutely tremendous piece, uh, kind of a two-parter, but the, the second part of it, um, I think, really crystallized a lot of what's going on right now in China's perception of what the U.S. is doing um, by nature of running a current account deficit and having the world's reserve currency, the ability to cheat the system that way where the mutual and reciprocal benefits of that have now worn off, where we previously needed to buy their stuff and they needed to sell us the stuff and we needed them to fund our deficits. We now find ourselves in a different position where regardless of what one thinks about the Chinese equity outlook that we've been spending time on, it's entirely possible that one could say the risk reward calculus of the equity side and the potential for CCP interventions, whether or not yeah, that it means, makes it uninteresting. Yeah. But what but one may one may say that they agree or not on your US conclusions, the cultural trends that are disconcerting, the uh, the things we've seen over the last 18 months, what it means for valuations in American technology sector, something I completely agree with you on. Um, regardless of, of one's viewpoint on US investing, equity or debt. We do find ourselves with this situation where I'm increasingly coming to the belief that Chinese debt and the objectives of those who issue it are aligned with Western investors who may want to buy it. Yeah, a, no store, doubt. a store of value, stability, a yield premium. Um, I think this is your thesis too, but I'd love for you to unpack this more. Well, it's very much my thesis. And look, it's... Uh theme of the book I wrote two years ago called The Clash of Empires. But look, look, I think you, you, you always have to start off, you know, walking a mile in somebody else's shoes, right? Um, first, because when they realize that they, they, you have their shoes, you're a mile away. Um, but secondly, um, you know, if you put yourself into Xi Jinping's shoes today, your view is the U.S. is out to get me, right? Um, you know, they've taken down my biggest company. They, they're out to get me. And I have three big weaknesses. The first is the semiconductor industry. So I'm going to plow money and I'm going to co coerce my tech sector into solving that vulnerability. My second uh, big vulnerability is energy. And we can talk about that if you want. And my third big vulnerability is uh, my dependency on the US dollar. Most of my trade is settled. Um, most of too much of my capital spending still occurs in US dollars, et cetera. Um, and if tomorrow the U.S. wants to do to me what it did to Russia, what it did to Sudan, what it did to Iran or Venezuela and cut me off the U.S. dollar, my economy risks imploding. Now, granted, you know, for the U.S. to do that would mean triggering a global depression. So, you know, it'd be, it might be cutting their nose to spite their face. But if you're Xi Jinping, you have to, you know, hope for the best and plan for the worst. The worst is I get cut off from the dollar funding. Um, that anybody doing business with China is not allowed to use the U.S. dollar anymore. So if that's my big risk, the solution is I have to transfer my trade from US dollar to renminbi. I don't have a choice. Like geostrategically, geopolitically, I do not have a choice. Um, 
And but, but again, I don't. I think your argument still holds without the most extreme concern of the U.S. literally cutting it off. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, you know, the U.S. can, between cutting it off and putting pressure, like restricting access, et cetera, there's, there's many, you know, well, many shades of gray. Yeah, yeah, there's many shades of gray, et cetera. But basically, if, if the U.S. is no longer a friendly nation to me, if I'm China, again, I'm walking a mile in their shoe, the U.S. is no longer a friendly nation to me, why would I want to be dependent on the dollar? Why would I want to be dependent on the willingness and ability of American banks to fund my trade? You know, it's 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 not uh, it's it's not a healthy or stable situation. It's like a Damocles sword that's over my head at, at all times. So, if that's my starting point, I have no choice now. So I have to transform the renminbi into a trade and reserve currency. Now, the only way I can do that, the only way I can transform the renminbi into a trade and reserve currency is if the renminbi is a structurally strong currency. Now, if you look at the past 10 years, the past five years, the past three years, the past 18 months, the past 12 months, the renminbi is the world's strongest major trading currency. This is not a coincidence. Um, and, the renminbi, and if I'm gonna basically tell South Korea, tell Indonesia, tell Thailand, look, from now on we're trading in renminbi, I need to give them a strong and stable bond market that they can invest in. Um, and lo and behold, the renminbi bond market is the best performing bond market over the past 18 months, three years, five years, 10 years, et cetera. So yes, to your point, it's, um, it's, that, that's where we stand. And I'll just, I know I'm long-winded, but I'll conclude with a very uh, simple anecdote. But my, um, my very first client was a gentleman called Biat Knotts. Um, and he's, uh, he ran a firm called Notchtuki in, in Geneva. Uh, he's now passed away, unfortunately. And when I started the business, he said, look, Louis, it's an easy business. You have to remember, you know, when you're not certain of what to do, when it's crisis time, when low visibility of what's happening, you have to remember that U.S. policymakers and the Fed especially will always follow policies so to make shareholders whole. Meanwhile, the Bundesbank, I guess I'm showing my age because there was still a Bundesbank, the yeah. Bundesbank will, and German policymakers will always follow policies to make German bondholders whole. So when you don't know what to do, you buy bonds in Germany and you buy stocks in the US. And by the way, if I'd followed that advice, I'd be a lot wealthier today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the reality is there is no more Bundesbank. It's been absorbed with an ECB that now has different set of priorities. The new Bundesbank is the People's Bank of China because the, they need the strong currency. They need the high real rates to transform their currency from a never was currency into a reserve currency. Um, and that's, th that's, that's the global landscape today. And by the way, for the past 10 years, if you own Chinese bonds and US equities, that was basically the best portfolio you could have. It delivered the best risk adjusted returns. Um, and because both sets of policies still today in China, everything is done to make sure that the currency stays strong. Look at Look at uh, the past few weeks as an example. When they took down the education stocks, the stock market tanked. It was down 5% two days in a row. On the first day, foreigners sold. The renminbi went down 50 basis points. On the second day, while the stocks were down another 5%, the renminbi went back up 60 basis points. That could only be government intervention. It could only be. Uh, as all the foreigners were leaving, they stepped into the market. So, you know, you buy your bonds in China, you buy your stocks in the U.S., and so um, let me get you to answer this for listeners um, so that I don't have to, but it is essentially going to unpack this distinction that, that I was struggling with before. One of the arguments on the equity side is that the, the Chinese authorities have an incentive to disrupt what's been taking place with the red hot growth sector because they don't want to be reliant on Western capital. They don't want to be reliant on Western technology, Western customers. They certainly don't want to be reliant on Western social structures. And so the aftermath of what's happened, the bloodletting in the Chinese tech internet sector is perfectly aligned with their policy and their strategic objectives. And so yet I saw initially an inerrant contradiction in saying that they didn't want to be dependent on Western capital in the equity side, but why would they want to be dependent on 
Western capital in the debt side. And what I believe you have concluded is that they would in no way be reliant on Western capital. In fact, what they're simply doing is fortifying their own currency and, and bond market for Asian investors. And we're just simply trying to look for a way for Western investors to take advantage of this. Is this a, a better exactly restatement? Right. The, the aim, look, China knows, China's not doesn't want to be dependent on Western investors for its debt markets. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's opening its debt market to foreigners, but let's face it, it's not URI that is targeted. Uh, it's the Thais, it's the Koreans, it's the Indonesians, it's all of Africa, it's the Middle East, it's Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, the message isn't to CalPERS or to um, or or to or to the know, Bonson Group or to yeah. the Bonson Group. It's <laughs> it's not you. They're not knocking on your door saying, "Hey, look, instead of buying U.S. Treasuries, this is this is a better return." They're knocking on the door of the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Saudi Arabia and saying, "Look." Instead of being in U.S. Treasuries, why aren't you in uh, in renminbi? And by the way, why don't you start pricing your oil in renminbi instead of pricing it in, in U.S. dollars? And if you price it in renminbi, then you can earn renminbi, and then you can place those renminbis into bonds that are going to give you much higher, uh, much higher real and nominal returns than you are going to get in U.S. Treasuries. That's the goal. You know, getting the money off the Banson Group is it's not even on the priority list. Yeah. And so that and so then uh, for those. U.S. investors that are worried about capital controls, governance, these things that have happened with that rideshare company and with yeah. the after-school tutoring companies, the reason they can't do that to U.S. investors that sneak in the back door to own sovereign debt is because it would be totally contradictory to their trillion-dollar objectives with Saudi, with Malaysia, with, with, with other neighboring countries in, in their geopolitical strategic initiatives. Exactly. I think if you have to worry about capital controls, it's not going to be that China tells you, uh, David, you can't buy your, the Chinese bonds because if they do, they kill all the work they've done in the past 10 years to transform the renminbi into a reserve currency. So they're not going to do that. The risk is that it's actually the U.S. government that tells you, you, David, can't 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 buy into the the cap, the risk on the capital controls is not on the Chinese side. China had capital controls and it keeps gradually reducing them. Um, the question, the, and again here going back to the Western world moving into cap, uh, moving more and more Chinese. Uh, the risk is actually the Western world imposing more and more capital controls, saying you can't invest in this, you can't invest in that. Uh, you know, if it produces oil, you can't produce it, you can't invest in this. Um, if it uh, if it you know. Uh, is cruel to animals. You can't, uh, if it doesn't have so many women on its board, you can't invest, in, invest in it, et cetera. It's, uh, it's the Western world where the capital controls are growing. Um, and it's, uh, it's in China that they're easing up. And, and so the, um, is it fair to say, honestly, Louis, to kind of unpack your ideology here, that you're not merely favorable to some of the Asian uh, economic circumstances for investment but bearish on, on the U.S.? Or is it a better way to put it, you're bearish on the trajectory of U.S., which is not a short-term comment one way or the other? Um, look, Warren Buffett said never sell it short the U.S., right? Uh, the, uh, I'm definitely bearish on the U.S. dollar. Um, I'm, I'm bearish on the U.S. dollar. And... Um, you know, I look at the, the, the growth rate of, of, of monetary aggregates. I think the, the U.S. dollar and the growth rate of government spending and budget deficits in the U.S., which is uh, outsized relative to the U.S.'s own history, outsized relative to, frankly, anybody's history or, or anybody else uh, doing in the world right now. You know, last year, in 2020, the U.S. increased its debt per, per American by $13,000, the U.S. government. Um, you know, in Europe, which was also following crazy policies, it was between four and $6,000 per person. In China, it was just marginally above $1,000 per person. So, you know, this is, you know, the, the increase in debt that we're, and all funded. No, you know, I, know, I think I would push back in this sense, though, yeah. the, the, the debt per person growth, it doesn't change the fact that the debt to GDP ratios still are what they are. Yeah, the, so, the, the, so, the, the Europeans still have us beat by a lot, a large portion, and, Japan, and Japan's crushing everybody. 
Well, actually, if you look at uh, debt debt to GDP by the end of this year, I think the U.S. will be topping Japan. Um, Are you talking about on an annual deficit or or total credit card balance? T- total to- the balance. I'll send I you think, some charts. I think we'll end up the year at one hundred and fifty, and they'll end up the year at two hundred and thirty. Uh, okay, you now you net it out um, because a lot of the government debt in in Japan they owe to themselves. Um, and and so, so do we. I, I, I'm doing the same. We're, you're, I'm not, so you're right. The entitlement thing, if that's what you mean, yeah. gets trickier. Yeah. But um, the, you know, t- but leaving, technically, leaving, leaving, we, okay. you include central bank, then, uh, yeah, the, the, all the countries have a lot of debt that could be netted out. Yeah. But uh, in Japan, the big difference is all of Japan's, most of Japan's debt now is actually owned by the central bank. And pretty much all the Japanese debt is owned by the Japanese. The big difference from the U.S., and there's very few countries that have as much external debt as the U.S., uh, and that have uh, net external, deeply negative net external investment positions. Um, yeah. you, you know, like Japan receives money from abroad every year because of its, uh, of its very positive inter- uh, internal investment uh, positions. Um, the U.S. sends out money. Uh, yeah. Every year, now I think you know when you look at the amount of, and that amount of money that the U.S. needs to send out to the rest of the world keeps on keeps on increasing. So you know every year you sell more of the family silver, and you know the the beauty of the U.S. the strength of the U.S. is its ability to create new assets to sell to foreigners, whether it be Google shares or Apple shares or uh, or buildings in Miami. Um, but or, it, but it, it, it's productivity. I mean, I don't want to short sell it. The, what they're selling is not just always overpriced uh, Pebble Beach and Rockefeller Center to Japanese in 1987. Uh, there is also a legitimately more um, no, no, robust no. growth engine. That's the that's the real key di- differential is um, excessive and uh, and surprising statism in the U.S. in New Zealand is reasonably surprising. Mm. Yes. And, and and statism in, in China of that nature is priced. It's priced. And I would say, um, you know, the, the big priced question- Priced in equity risk premium and in bond yield? I think it's in, well, yeah, bond yield. China is the only place in the world offering positive real rates. So it sits uh, in it's this priced little, into the it, you guys put a chart out. It wasn't a report that you had written, but some of your colleagues, it was just fascinating to me how China's like in this perfect little sweet spot where we know how developed of a country it truly is. And they don't obviously have the nine or 11% yields that like Turkey or South right. Africa may have, but they're not sitting there at the zero bound like US and exactly Italy. Right. And so you're just in this little sweet spot of like a soft EM yield with, yep. a, D, with a DM economic safety. And I think you just saw that, uh, you just saw that in recent weeks, right? When equities in China got crushed, usually in emerging markets, if your equity market gets crushed, you also get crushed on the bonds. You know, if tomorrow the Indonesian stock market goes down 25% for whatever reason, you'll also lose money on your Indonesian bonds. Um, here you had Chinese stocks got crushed for a bolt out of the blue, right? The government deciding we're, we're gonna kill the educational stocks. So all the stocks got crushed on the back of it. The bonds went up. Which uh, is the, the way treasuries used to function for us exactly. as a tail risk hedge until we got to the lower bound. It's harder for them to do that. Exactly. But you think, but there could be a legitimate tail risk hedge for U- U.S. investors with Chinese I debt. I think Chinese government bonds are the new anti-fragile asset class of choice. To go back to Talib's notion of, you know, yeah. things that thrive in uh, in adversity. Uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. Treasuries with that for our entire generation, because you and I are more or less the same age. Our entire generation, and then even people who are ten years older than us. U.S. Treasuries were the ultimate anti-fragile edge. Yeah. Um, they haven't really been in the past 18 months or so. Is it the euthanization of the U.S. dollar that takes away the anti-fragility, or is it the zero bound? I think it's I, well. Look, I think the zero bound is is, is a lot to do with it. Um, but uh, look, as I think as a bond investor, you want to own bonds in a strong currency, right? Um, and you know, when you have central banks that come out every chance they get, say, look, we want to get higher inflation. We're not worried about it. We want to get higher inflation. We're not worried about inflation. They're in essence saying, you know, if a central bank says we want to get higher inflation, 
they're in essence saying we want a weak currency. Like that's the other side of the same coin. We want your money to buy less is when they say we want higher inflation. Um, that's a weak currency, uh, whether it's domestically or internationally. It's, you know, when a central bank says, I want higher inflation, they say, they, they say I want a weaker currency. And, and my uh, argument for a long time has been, yeah, the US is saying all that, but then Europe is saying it too, and Japan yeah. is saying it too. Yeah. And China is saying the opposite. And China is saying the opposite. So China, so, in a lot of ways, becomes not just an anti, uh, uh, sort of contrary US story, but contrary Euro, yeah. contrary Brussels, contrary Absolutely. Tokyo. So, look, I, you know, I think the, which is going to be weaker between the US, the Euro, the Yen, et cetera, it all becomes a mux game. It's all a race for the bottom. So if it's if if you have four guys, uh, you know, on your starting block, the four big economic zones, Japan, Europe, US, China, the one that stands apart is China saying, I don't want a weak currency. I want a strong currency. Uh, so like and all the other three are saying, well, I want a weak currency. To me, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to say, OK, I'm going to go with that guy. I'm going to go with the guy who says I want a strong currency. And, and they are saying they want it and it's in their um, strategic imperative to do so, I think you could get any number of US presidents, including one who can get elected, that can say the same thing. That was one thing that was funny about Trump's relative economic ignorance is he actually kind of said he wanted a weaker dollar yep. because no one told him you're not supposed, you're to, supposed say to say that. that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but but I think that- um, But it's I not think, like Biden's come out and said he wants a strong dollar either. No, he hasn't necessarily said it, but he, but he couldn't necessarily say the opposite. And he kind of, yep. you know, there. I think that the U.S. still has this, the Bob Rubin school and uh, uh, that, look, at the end of the day, you want to talk like your four king dollar, even while your debt profile requires you to want to inflate away a lot of the impact of your so, debt. And that's, so me, where, that's me, to me, the big distinction of what you're describing. Japan, Europe, and America are aligned at the hip. And regardless of what the exact numbers are, debt to GDP is untenable. China is not facing that same position. So let me ask you this, you know, yeah, Bob Rubin was all about the strong dollar, et cetera. And, um, and Larry Summers as a sort of, you know, right, you know, Robin to Rubin's Batman um, has been bitching about the, you know, the inflationary position of the Fed yeah. and, you know, and, uh, but, you know, what in the past 10 years, I would say, frankly, since, since Bush came to power uh, and started following guns and butter policies, you know, what, what part of uh, U.S. policy making, you know, they, they might say they're for a strong dollar, but, you know, it's, it's what you say and what you do. What have they done to show that they are for a strong dollar? Let me well, suggest what do you this. Think, what do you think moved the dollar up so substantially 2014 to 18? Uh, very simple. The U.S. went from producing 5 million barrels of oil per day to 12 million barrels per day. So the it's US, entirely a Petro story. Yeah, the U.S. the U.S. basically stopped exporting 150 to 200 billion dollars a year to buy its energy from abroad. Yep. Um, and the US added, you know, basically almost to Saudi Arabia. Uh, now, you know, that's an economic transformation that is frankly fairly unprecedented. A adding a Saudi Arabia to your economy in just four years. Yep. Um, and I wrote a book about that back in 2011 called Too Different for Comfort. It's highlighting like, look, the shale oil revolution is massively U.S. dollar bullish. Uh, you know, most economic activity is energy transformed. The fact that the U.S. moved from being the world's largest energy importer to basically roughly flat on its energy trade balance in the space of seven or eight years, again, it's unprecedented in the history of, totally. of, of the world. And that much, and, and, but so now the question, you know, that was a huge tailwind for the U.S. dollar. That tailwind has now disappeared or it's been cashed in. Um, so unless you think the U.S. now goes from producing 12 million barrels per day to, to 19, which given the level of CapEx unfolding in the energy industry would, uh, so either that or somehow, you know, we invent a new way of energy, right? And that the U.S. gets to lead that. Um, Unless that happens, that's behind us. Um, and the odds are that that's behind us. No, I, I would agree. And I would, I would actually argue paradoxically that the weaker dollar that you forecast, I think would end up being bullish to the U.S. energy industry going forward. But, and, and so you would get a chicken or egg 
um, th those things will kind of uh, teeter totter with each other. But the reality is, we're not going to get to 19 million a day. No. And even <laughs> apart from ESG and and greenies and and all the other uh, political aspects, the economic structure, the capex in shale. Uh, cannot finance 19 million a day. Yep. And, and so I agree it removes a, um, a tailwind for dollar and, and, and kind of reverses that to some degree. But at the end of the day, we still do, not even counting China in the list, we still have a sort of race to the bottom dynamic where we're not going to go to negative yields. Now, you, you may disagree with that. And maybe a future central banker says, no, I changed my mind. But it doesn't seem to me, even apart from the ideological statements that a pal and others, I think, rightly make that, no, we won't go negative yields. Our banking system is such that I just don't simply understand how they could do it. And so the amount of debt that has been able to trade negative yields in, in, in Europe and, in, and uh, Japan doesn't seem that that can happen in the U.S., and as long as they stay at the zero bound or below the zero bound in Japan and Europe, it still seems it puts a bit of a floor in on the dollar. Um, and yet I don't exactly say that as a bullish statement. So after the past, eight, personally, after the past 18 months we've had, when it comes to policymaking, I've, I've got a sign on my desk that says, uh, strike can't happen from your vocabulary. Because um, after the 18 months we've had, who knows? Um, you know, I'm not, it's, um, now having said that, uh, I agree with you that negative interest rates are highly unlikely to happen. And that it would, you know, the experience of Europe, the experience of Japan is negative interest rates serve no purpose but decimating the banks. I mean, yeah. by and large, they, they really haven't triggered anything except crushing the bank's margins. Uh, and that's so, the problem when I say something like what I said is I'm not saying it because they would never do it. I'm saying it that they have actually got to learn they would do it, but then they saw it, others do it and it didn't work. And so now they don't have to do it. No, no. And, you know, like the Swedish central bank is walking it back. Right. They've they've come out and they said, look, we did it. They were the first ones to do it. They've come out and they said, look, it's 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 stupid, et cetera. Uh, and that brings me to another point. I think when we look at foreign exchanges, you know, you and I, we, we've been trained our whole lives to think of exchange rate as against the euro and the yen, right? Those were the big yeah. ones. Um, but there's a lot of other currencies out there. Um, and today you have already central banks that are signaling they're already tightening. So the UK is one, they're going to be tightening soon. The UK is one of them. Canada is another. Uh, a lot of emerging markets uh, currencies. And, you know, the world in 10, 20, 30 years time, emerging markets will continue to be bigger, et cetera. So, you know, I, I tend to think, the euro is increasingly irrelevant. You know, Europe is slipping. You know, Europe will become an open air museum over time and slipping into irrelevance. That's not where the excitement is. Um, so, you know, if you're in America and you think, okay, my currency is going down, but I don't want to buy the euro, sure. But there's other things you can buy. You can buy sterling, you can buy the Canadian dollar, you can buy the renminbi, you can buy a lot of emerging market currencies that are today being beaten up and where you're getting higher yields. And so, you know, you know, if you if you take well, if you take the difference in yield between, for example, between you know uh, Indonesia and and the U.S. today, um, you know, for for you to lose money, you know, given the compounding of interest rates over a period of ten years, for you to lose money over ten years, if you compound, let's say, a six percent uh, in, interest rate differential, you know, the Indonesian the in, over ten years, the Indonesian currency would have to fall by more than half for you to lose money. Um, and, you know, that can, I'm not saying it can't happen, but, you know, it was Einstein who said compounding is the most powerful force in the universe. If you're compounding in high yielding currencies that are today very undervalued, that have just gotten, you know, beaten like a redhead stepchild, yeah, it's, that, that might, you know, forget the euro and the yen. That's not where the excitement is going to be. That's for sure. Well, I think the renminbi story is a little more compelling than the Indonesian one. <laughs> Even apart from the compounding of the yield, the uh... well, okay. Hold on to this. Hold on to this thought, because let me throw an argument why Indonesia. I'm a big bull of Indonesian government bonds, but let me let me give you the reason. Is I think China's trying to do to Asia what Europe, did, what Germany did to Europe, really. Where you know, in the 1970s, Treasury Secretary Connolly told the Americans, "Look, the U.S. dollar is our currency and your problem." 
and you have to, um, and the Europeans said, okay, fine, then we're going to start trading in Deutschmark rather than, than US dollars. And the Deutschmark became the, the, the currency of reference in Europe. And initially you made the most money on German boons. But through 30 years, you actually made the most money on Italian bonds because Italian bond yields were so high. And then they started moving towards the German bond yields. And uh, so German bond yields went down, but Italian bond yields went down a whole lot more. And as the German currency became the anchor for Europe, the Italian lira started to you know, basically behave like the Deutschmark. If you start seeing things fairly similar in, in Asia, where today China goes to Indonesia and said, look, stop being dependent on the dollar and don't worry, we'll backstop you. Uh, I'll give you swap lines with my central banks. And if ever, you know, there's whatever hit, you know, we're not going to pull the rug underneath you like US banks did in 1998 and in 2008. Um, we'll always be there to back you up, et cetera. Then all of a sudden, the Indonesian rupiah starts being so volatile, at least against the RMB, which is what's happening. And then over time, the Indonesian bond yields fall down to the level of Chinese bond yields. So you actually make more money into Indonesian government bonds. And you don't yeah. have to deal with the human rights issues. So you get a more positive contagion effect. Yeah. Uh, maybe, but maybe adding a bit to your, your standard deviation. Uh, definitely higher volatility. You had higher volatility. In, but, you know, for the period, basically in the 30 years that preceded the European crisis of 2012, Italian bonds was one of the very best performing asset classes in the world. It actually outperformed the S&P 500, even though the S&P 500 was in a roaring bull market. All right, so now we have uh, teed up what will be the third appearance for <laughs> Mr. Gov, a full podcast dedicated to discussing Indonesian debt. There we go. Um, but, but I sort of <laughs> see your point, and I think, I think that there is, uh, uh, in all seriousness, a sort of regional story yeah. behind the narrative you're describing in China, that it, if what, everything we're saying about China's best interest is true, and I think it is, then it does stand to reason that there would be regional it's going and to leak neighbor, abroad. neighboring impacts. And, and so it, that's something to, to think about. Um, we got to cut it off there. We've gone, we've gone on uh, long enough, but it is the kind of thing where I think I could just sit here and keep talking to you for a couple more hours. So I very much appreciate your time and your insights. Um, I certainly hope that for listeners right now, you can appreciate if there's little areas in which you may have found disagreement or have a different conclusion, you can at least see the incredible thoughtfulness and consistency across the argument that Louis is making. I believe that we are facing, uh, as we were, and this is something that frustrates me as someone who's lived through some of these most significant events, is I get to look back on some of these moments, so, such as China entering WTO, and view it as this... Um, rather significant moment in global economic history that I was completely, totally unaware of at the time when it was happening. And, and I believe that is something that we're talking about now. What are the things happening now that are going to be the moments we talk about in 10 and 20 and 25 years, the way we can talk about some of these events with the euro, with uh, China uh, entering the developed uh, trade world, things of that nature. Um, and I believe if we're trying to skate to where the puck is going, to, to use the overused cliche, uh, would behoove us to, to incorporate, at least in the thought process, regardless of the decisions that we make out of it, um, to consider the very, I think, cogent argument that uh, China's best interests are aligned with a more stable currency for them and therefore a more stable debt market and that the best interest of many competitive countries are the exact opposite. And therefore that needs to play into how investors think about their bond investing and currency positioning. Uh, Lewis, thanks again for your time. My and pleasure. I do, I do, Great maybe you. you'll be the Well, hopefully you, you see what I mean uh, about Lewis's uh, remarkable intelligence. He, he has a lot to say. Uh, there's a lot I'm wrestling with in this subject still. Um, some of his writing, it's institutional research. It's, it's an absolutely vital part of our research and discovery process at the Bonson Group. We've been uh, institutional subscribers to GovCal for about um, six and a half, seven years now. But um, I, I think that you hopefully see that there is a compelling case to be made here for uh, what is unfolding on the world stage. 
and that this is not about uh, participating in it or not participating in it, following it or not following it, um, being invested in it or not being invested in it. This is happening whether people want to or not, and what it means and how it plays out and what the various exposures are is the stuff we have to unpack. But I absolutely believe we live in a territory here in the United States where it's a stated policy objective. Maybe uh, the stated part is somewhat nuanced, but it is a policy objective to weaken the currency and uh, that there exists a region of the, of the world where it is very much a policy objective to strengthen the currency um, and try to normalize um, access to their currency uh, at, by creating uh, stable organic interest rates and, and uh, stable uh, medium of value uh, for the purpose of their own strategic ends. And investors would be very wise to understand the repercussions of both sides of this East and West. So that's what my conversation with uh, Mr. Gov was intended to do. And uh, I really hope that you will read the entire DividendCafe.com this week to let this be unpacked more. And we will take it from there uh, as the Bonson Group continues its uh, study in this great subject. We're, we're prepared to wrap up here in another uh, month, month and a half. With that said, thank you for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe.